Take five. If we had a little music, we could do Dave Brubeck. Da -da 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 -da. Good idea. Asked, but in reality, the amalgam era, the amalgam didn't fail. It was the tooth that failed. So the post amalgam era is to save the tooth. If we had to decide which is going to fail, we always want our restorations to fail, not the tooth to fail. <clears throat> In this post amalgam era, there are a lot of people who are trying to make a lot of money from dentistry, and they make it by making uh, sales pitches to you saying, this is going to be a easier uh, way to fix a tooth. And so they give you universal adhesives. They give you bulk fill materials. And they say these are going to be, are going to work. They just don't tell you how long they're going to work. Um, a successful restoration, if you had a patient and gave the patient a choice that I can restore your tooth and it can last three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years, uh, and said, you know, how, how long do you want this uh, tooth to be restored? Every patient will say, as long as possible. Now, some patient will say, how much is it going to cost? <laughs> At least in, the, in America, they talk about that all the time. We, we have to decide, you know, how much does it cost? When I was a kid, the longest lasting car, when you would buy a car, whether it was a Ford, a Chevrolet, or Chrysler, was 100,000 miles. My father told me when I was very young, cars are not going to go more than 100,000 miles. Fast forward to today. We have Asian cars that go 200, 300,000 miles and even more. Now, the Asian cars, when they came to America, all the American car dealers said, oh, no, our cars are as good. But after five years, 10 years, 15 years, then patients were, or the car purchasers were able to figure out that all cars weren't created equal. So in a lot of ways, we say biomedic dentistry is like the Asian car production. They have better science, better technology, and have longer lasting results. That's what we have. But it's not gonna come in that way. So here's a faster way with a non-gold standard bonding system that's on the tooth. The tooth is two millimeters deep, four millimeters wide, four millimeters wide. And this is real time. The enamel has been removed here. So this is called optical coherence tomography. It was developed in Japan. Uh, Junji Tagami and his right-hand man, uh, Dr. Ali Sader, uh, made this video. <clears throat> The adhesive has been polymerized, but it has not been given time to mature. The bulk fill material is shrinking on the high end of shrinkage, which is usually between 1.5 and 5% of shrinkage. So using a below average bonding system, and it's simplified and quick, and a composite that is very quick to put in, uh, the bulk fill, once the light is placed, within a minute, you will see a gap formed. And this gap will be filled with pulpal fluid. And that pulpal fill fluid, when the restoration is bitten on, will cause pain. But as the patient bites on it, what will happen? This gap will start to peel. And eventually, it will get into the oral cavity. And so the pulpal fluid, instead of going down into the pulp and causing pain, will go out into the oral cavity. And so the dentist says, I, I know that this tooth hurts, but it's going to get better. They'll take it out of occlusion, but still, with many foods, they will still have pressure enough to cause the pain. But eventually, the pain goes away. But why did it go away? Because the seal on one side of the tooth has been completely lost, and now the pulpal fluid is moving out in the oral cavity instead into the pulp, so the pain on biting goes away. But what's the bad thing? Now you have a gap that can be reinfected and does get reinfected and eventually that will be the cause of recurrent decay. So this is a very important slide. 
but it's a slide that is based on some very technical research that we study in the mastership. Um, and very few, even dental scientists, ever talk about this. But the researchers who published this research, Anthony Verschluch and the Bacalho team, under the direction of Verschluch, uh, came to the right conclusions. In composite shrinkage, you can never eliminate the shrinkage. 3M spent over a million dollars, two million dollars, with a researcher named John Ike to try to make a non-shrinking composite. They used a composite molecule that actually expanded. It was called a silorane. But the problem is, if a composite expands, then you have stress on the hybrid layer just like when it contracts. And it turned out that the bonding systems weren't able to be developed. It was a failure. 3AM, 3M sold a lot of it, of course. They never gave anybody a refund. They never apologized to anybody. But the idea of a non-shrinking composite was tried by the best chemists that we had in the United States. It failed. But the shrinkage we have on the composite, it's less and less than it's ever been. But the importance is that you cannot totally get rid of it. So when the shrinkage happens, there's always stress. But the stress goes in three areas. Those three areas are the weakening of the hybrid layer, <clears throat> internal stresses in the composite, or stress to the tooth structure that causes the tooth to come closer or strain, and that strain can cause a fracture in the tooth structure. Of these three, there's only one that's going to lead to recurrent decay, and that is going to be a hybrid layer that does not get uh, fully polymerized. So we can have that happen 100% of the time. We can make a hybrid layer that is stronger than natural dentin, but we have to have a protocol that does that, and that protocol is called decoupling with time. If we have the stress to the tooth and it breaks, it will allow decay. The decay in this large composite <coughs> was developed in a hybrid, in a uh, peripheral seal zone. And this was the final preparation. So this case was done almost 20 years ago. And when I was telling other dentists about the biomimetic approach that I had developed 20 years ago, I would show this preparation to the dentists and 100% of the dentists knew, they had absolute knowledge that this preparation could never support a restoration. You couldn't chew on it, it wouldn't work. How did those dentists know that? They, know that, they knew that because they were taught, taught a dogma. They were taught a mechanical approach dentistry dogma that if you put amalgam on that or if you put gold on that, it's going to fall off. You had to have retention form. You had to have resistance form. Well, now that we have restorations that number in the hundreds of thousands in non-retentive preps just like that, all of a sudden, the scientific base has totally changed but you have to have a high bond strength to have these non retentive preparations last for decades. As Davey said, a biologic failure where there's decay, infection, we need to eliminate that. We need to eliminate the <clears throat> strain to the heart tissues as much as we can, but the main thing is to prevent the catastrophic failures. These are two restorations that were done 22 years ago, never showed any sign of leakage. We have many doctors that we've trained who have done 10,000 biobases with zero recurrent decay under any biobase, just like you saw Disha's. Those cases are never going to have recurrent decay. Now, can you have a chip in the enamel? Of course. The functional occlusions are permanent. You're going to be having the patients occasionally a small amount of fracture of the 
um, enamel, and that's called a clinical failure. But with no biologic failure, then it's an easy repair. <clears throat> Here are two teeth I did on my sweet wife at the same day. One I did biomedically and one I did non-biomedically with her permission, of course, <laughs> saying that when this or if this fails, it would be re replaced free of charge. <laughs> but this onlay obviously has better marginal adaptation after 10 years than this bicuspid. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this paper that was published in 1999 by my second mentor that I've had in adhesive dentistry. The first was Ray Bertolotti, and this was Gary Unterbrink. He's still alive, retired in Croatia. But uh, Gary Unterbrink and Bill Liebenberg summarized three papers from a team out of Amsterdam, a polymerization curve. If you have a slow initiation of your, of your polymerization, and then you get to a high bond strength, that's just a function of the chemistry of that dental bonding system. Other bonding systems will have early polymerization uh, conversion, but then a lower bond strength. But if you have the stress from the cavity, which we call the C factor, the stress from the, the cavity has to be compared on a time scale of when the polymerization strength is occurring. And so this stress from the cavity that we call C factor is very much a function of time. And so when I read these papers originally and uh, read this first paragraph, I actually got this paper in a pre-publication form from Dr. Unterbrink in 1998. The fir very first sentence said, adhesive dentistry could be expressed as a simple relationship between bonds and stress. If the bonds can withstand the stress, the restorative technique will be successful. And so from that, I started to list how can you make higher bond strengths. And I came up with eight different protocols that the science had shown increases bond strength. And then I said, how many ways can you stress a polymerization uh, competition in a restore, in a uh, adhesive restoration. And I actually came up with 10 ways to stress. And so there has to be a way to decrease the stresses to maximize the bond strengths. It's kind of like a teeter-totter. Do we have teeter-totters in India? Do you know what a teeter-totter is? Oh. Can't do that. A seesaw. Thank you. A seesaw. It's like a seesaw. If one end is up, the other end is down. If this is the bond, you have to have low stresses. You can't have high stresses and high bonds. You cannot have high stresses and high bonds. And so when I started to make my list in 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, and then when this paper was published in 1999, I pretty much had had crystallized the ways that you can make a restoration uh, permanent. So the concept that came <coughs> first was called the hierarchy of bondability. Another phrase that has not been taught unless you've been taught by the Allemans because that's our proprietary concept. And this hierarchy of bondability is simple. In the restoration, the surfaces you're bonding to have a different amount of hydroxyapatite. So it's like a ladder. The top of the ladder is enamel because it has the most hydroxyapatite. Then you have superficial detin, then you have intermediate detin, then you have deep detin, then you have inner caries, and then you have outer caries. There's six levels. It's just the amount of hydroxyapatite that indicates how easy it is to bond to and how quickly it will bond. Enamel is very different than dentin. Dentin that's infected is different than 
Denton that is affected. So we have those areas. But even in Denton, root Denton is different than coronal Denton. So this book was published in 1998. Unfortunately, it's uh, not in print right now, but the concepts can be accessed, and we publish those on our Instagram account. But the main way is to obviously uh, obtain a copy of the book or a copy in the PDF. We have that available to our mastership. But this substance that we're talking about in Denton basically is a collagenous protein, collagen, all of the collagen is, is encrusted in hydroxyapatite. If you have a demineralized dentin, you just have collagen. And then this area right here that has some collagen and a lot of hydroxyapatite still encrusting it, this is where the rubber meets the road. When you demineralize collagen by total etching, the five microns of collagen does you nothing. It just makes your life more difficult. So the total etch technique that Fusiyama pioneered, he did that because he knew bonding to the smear layer was a problem. So he conditioned the dentin by taking off the smear layer with phosphoric acid. Our technique is to condition the, phosphor condition the smear layer by removing our third thinning it with air abrasion. So that's a conditioning step. But our conditioning step does not remove the smear plug out of the dental tubules. It does not take the peritubular uh, dentin away from the tubules, thus allowing the amount of tubular fluid to be very small uh, in your bonding area. Moisture in your bonding system always makes things more difficult. So when we understand how this is connected, and we understand that if you have dentin, you've got 50% hydroxyapatite, 30% collagen, and 20% water, the last thing you want to do is to open up those fire hydrants, those, the, the water coming out of the pulp, and a self-etching system does that, but it must be air braided to get maximum bond strength. The paper that Davey showed you from Van Meerbeek in 2003 showed that if you do <clears throat> not air or braid a self-etching surface that you're bonding to with your self-etching primers, if it's not conditioned with air abrasion, your bond strength is going to be about 35. If you air braid, it's going to be over 50. We don't do things to decrease our bond strengths in a biomimetic approach. So air abrasion, how much did your air abrasion unit cost, Adisha? It's not cheap. There are cheap air abrasion units that cost about $200. They're very messy, but they work. Other air, which air abrasion system do you have? The what? Aquacare. When you had that pulp exposure from your air abrasion, did you have the water on? You know that's wrong, right? You know that now. Okay. Okay. But... <clears throat> the techniques of using air abrasion, your systems, there's little things you have to learn here and there. A dry air abrasion on a deep uh, lesion needs to be compacted and so that outer carries with dry air abrasion will prevent the, the pulp exposure. Of course, the pulp exposure, when it's treated in a biomimetic way, is 100% successful. And we base that on information that was developed in the 90s from Charlie Cox and other Akimoto and other uh, researchers in Japan. So everybody take a picture of this. I guess it's getting recorded. This is a very important illustration. Uh, comes out of an article that hasn't been published yet. What's that? The pointer? Like that? All right, here we go. So let's look at this mineralization topographical map. One, enamel. Two, superficial dentin. Three, intermediate dentin. Four, deep dentin. Five, inner caries, that's the pink staining. And six, outer caries, that's there. 
So everybody should be able to see that in a bonding uh, protocol that you're trying to bond to all six of these different dental hard tissues, they have a different amount of hydroxyapatite, and that means that the ones that have the most hydroxyapatite will bond the fastest, and the one with the least amount of hydroxyapatite will take more time. But if you connect all six of these within the first minute of polymerization of your dental bonding system, then you will lose 80% in area six, you will lose 70% in area five, and you will lose 40% in area three, just like that. Because the whole two millimeter mass of composite moves right here, goes away from here, and so the strongest areas that don't need as much uh, bond strength get stronger. The areas next to the pulp that need the strongest sealing get weaker. Just the opposite of what you want. But the secret is, if you keep all of these disconnected from number one for at least five minutes, and you keep the volume of your composite less than two millimeters, these are the parameters that I deduce from 10,000 hours of studying 2,000 articles. Now, why did I spend 10,000 hours to read 2,000 articles that could have been spent teaching Hillary how to play golf? <laughs> I like the boys better than the girls, right? As I the idea is I only did this study for one reason. <laughs> oh, there's actually two reasons. Uh, but I was so frustrated with dentistry after 17 years of failures of my fillings and my crowns. I learned how to do good root canals, but the problems with failing root canals is what? The top isn't sealed. But after I had this frustration so much and I quit dentistry for six months, there was a problem. Not being a dentist in the United States versus being a history professor, which was going to be my new profession, reduced my income more than 50%. <laughs> and when you have six or seven children, probably that money could be well spent. But my wife, who is a very patient woman, obviously, she thought if I spent all this time studying, it was better if, because if I would stay in dentistry, then she'd have a little bit more money to raise her family. So that was a real practical consideration. But I also had a desire to actually know what's going on. Because I've been working with teeth for over 17 years. Three years in dental school and 17 years of practitioner. 20 years of my life, I'm working with these live tissues that are connected to the larger, largest sensory, uh, sensory uh, cervical, cervical, cerebral brain nerve. What am I talking? There's 12 what? Cranial nerves. Thank you. I'm trying to get the cranial nerves, right? So if we've got the trigeminal nerve, the fifth cranial nerve is like big and it hurts a lot, well, I'm probably doing things that are making that uh, react in a way that is, is very painful. What is the way to stop that? It was to seal those pulpal fibers, nerve fibers, that were getting stimulated with that in and out flow of pulpal fluid, either from a crack, a gap, or decay. Well, once I started to try to get to the bottom of how to increase bonds and decrease stresses, it's like I couldn't stop. It's like I'm learning things that nobody else has taught me. The adhesive science that started to come out of Japan in 1995 that first introduced me to adhesive dentistry had none of the polymerization dynamics and shrinkage stress from Amsterdam that we talked about in that, uh, those first graphs. In other words, you got these really smart people in Japan who are doing really good research on adhesives. All of their research is on flat surfaces with no decay. 
So that's called a C factor of zero, and that's called no decay. There's no hierarchy of bondability. They take off the enamel. They're just bonding to dentin. No hierarchy of bondability. And all of a sudden, they had very easy way to get some higher bond strengths. But as soon as they started to put cavity shapes in, and this came actually from a, a researcher from Turkey that, that got her PhD at TMDU named Sema Belli. And when she got there in 2000, she says, why do you guys just test these flat preparations? Says hardly any preparation in a dental practice is flat. So her supervisor on her PhD, Dr. Inokoshi, a friend of mine, very brilliant, very humble man, he listened to a woman, a woman not, that was not Japanese. And most Japanese think they don't have to listen to people that aren't Japanese so much. But Sema Belli changed the world at TMDU. And then after they started experimenting with the preparations that were actually C-factor, clinically significant, then she was the first one to actually say, Dr. Inokoshi, I've got this ribbon stuff that she got from Ray Berlotti, who got it from Dr. Rudo. That you, you met Rudo, didn't you, this year? Yes, Ray, yeah. Anyway, so she was the first one and said, hey, what if we put this ribbon in this in this uh, deep class one cavity. That was published in 2006. I can remember exactly when I read that in the Journal of Adhesive Dentistry in 2006. Immediately we started to use that technology in our teaching because we'd been teaching six lessons for three years, but this was a real breakthrough. And Semabelli had research in 2001, 2002 that was very significant. Um, unfortunately, in 2003, even by 2003, I didn't even know that she was a woman. So I knew her name, but I didn't really know her. But now she's a close friend, and she's organizing a conference in June next year in Turkey that if you can be there, there'll be some great speakers. Davey will be there. I'll be there. We'll be speaking. No, But there will be a lot of great speakers. Oh, so okay. So now let's just uh, move a little bit more into what we're talking about. These gold standard bonding systems have the ability to mimic the strength of, it, of the DEJ. And the strength of the DEJ was established in 2000 from TMDU, and it was around 50 megapascals. And they made the conclusion that if you can get a bonding, a bonding system to get on a flat surface about 50, or 40, we're so close to the cohesive strength of enamel and dentin, why are we even worried about retention form or resistance form? There need to be new principles of adhesive dentistry. Well, <clears throat> the answer is there is more to that. There is no simple way to get 30 and 50 in a cavity preparation that has more than one wall. Or two walls, you can get pretty, pretty easy, a uh, lot easier. A lot of the onlay preps you saw, Davy and Disha, look pretty much like a plate, right? But you can actually take uh, the principles of the six lessons and turn a bowl or a cup into a plate-like situation by keeping the thickness of your dentin replacement thin enough for a certain amount of time. Bart Van Meerbeek, we were speaking together 2019 at a conference at, in uh, Seattle. He summarized this in 2001. An adhesive restoration has many advantages over conven conventional non-adhesive restorative techniques, except that it cannot be realized in a simple way. Good prosthodontic restorative, mechanically retained dentistry as far as post-placement, preparation, impression, it cannot be done in a simple way. If you talk to a prosthodontist that's at the highest level of prosthodontic excellence and you say, how many steps do you need? I did this years ago to the best prosthodontist he, you know, in, in Utah. He thought he was the best dentist, but I thought the best dentist was the one that had the least uh, pulps dead and the most conservative approach to teeth, so we had that difference, but uh, 
he listed 14 things that he had to do to uh, have a proper crown result. Well, I listed 12 things you had to do to have a proper biomimetic restoration. Now, actually, I kind of cheated a little bit because there might be probably 15. But these ideas is that anything that's done with precision, whether it's playing golf or doing restorative dentistry, there's not going to be a sloppy way. There's not going to be an easy way. But how long does it take to restore a tooth biomimetically? An average is usually 1.5 hours to 2 hours chair time for the patient. If you do a crown and a buildup, particularly if it was a deep margin crown and you had to do a crown lengthening surgery, how long is that going to take the patient chair time to get his crown lengthening surgery, to get his root canal done, to get his buildup, to get his post, to get his impression, to get his temporary, to get his crown on? You can, the patient's going to be in the, in the chair two hours, but the doctor probably has more chair time with a biomimetic approach. So you have to have a little fewer patients. You charge a little bit more, perhaps, because if a crown's going to last on an average of 10 years, and this restoration is going to last over 20 years, the value is there. Mm. This paper that was published in 2002, when I read it, I said, this is absolutely important information. Why isn't anybody talking about this? And the answer is, nobody reads the literature. Dentists are lazy readers. We get that. Dentists don't, or dental students don't come up and demand a professor to be current in the literature because who would be the judge of what the literature is or to be current of it? Somebody would have, <laughs> that's right, right, Maha would do that. But the idea is that we have to realize that most dental schools are just not up to date. Because here's a fact. At three minutes, the bond to enamel is double the bond strength to dentin. Okay. Well, <clears throat> you know, most faculty members feel really comfortable bonding to enamel. So that tells them that the bond to enamel is what you should rely on. But this paper says if you wait five minutes, then the bond strength to enamel exceeds the bond to, to dentin, exceeds the bond to enamel. So it's a matter of time. So when I read that, I said, this is really important. Now, these are, you don't, can't see it in great detail, but all of these papers that we've put up uh, this morning have my notes on, and these are the papers that we use, and actually these notes are trademarked, copyrighted. I own the notes. I don't own the article. You know, when, you, when I publish an article with uh, Quintessence International Operative Dentistry, they make me sign away my copyright. You know, they own the article. They can sell it. But I actually own the notes, and so they, they don't give me any problem. But you can see that there's four different colors of ink here. What that means is that you've got to read these things numerous times to figure them out. These are researchers that only work on extracted teeth. They're in vitro dentists, and that's a good way to start. But it's like we are actually treating people that actually have trigeminal nerves connected to teeth. Extracted teeth never have that problem. They don't talk about sensitivity, cold, sweet, or biting. They just... Uh, let you do whatever you want to. But this is the paper from Van Meerbeek. Enamel is always less than dentin if you control for C factor and decay. So this idea that in the hierarchy of bondability, what's really happening is the hemohydrogel, which is the softest part of your uh, primer and your dental bonding systems, these hemomolecules are soft polymers, just like a contact lens. They're not hard, but they're swimming in 20% of water in dentin. And so they're trying to encapsulate the hydroxyapatite that is around the collagen fibrils. So to have a high bond strength, you can't just have collagen and you can't just have hydroxyapatite. So you can't dissolve the collagen with phosphoric acid and not have consequences. 
and you can't dissolve the hydrox I'm sorry hydroxyapatite with phosphoric acid and you can't just dissolve the collagen with bleach and have what you need to have a high bond strength. Both of those strategies have been tried and tested, but you have to understand that you need both, collagen and hydroxyapatite. So what that means is that the part of the hybrid layer that gives you strength is only 0.5 microns, a half a micron in thickness. Now wrap your mind around that. Your fingernail is 500 microns. So 0.5 is 100th the thickness of your fingernail. That is what is holding your restoration onto the tooth for 20 years and plus in a biomimetic restoration. What that means is that you've got connections that are molecularly strong, just like the mo molecules that don't fall apart every time you chew on a natural tooth. I mean, but the thinness of the hybrid layer, it's not five microns. Five microns isn't very much. But 0.5 microns is all you need. So the total etch approach that gets you a thicker hybrid layer in the five micron range does not mean that it's better than the 0.5 micron range of a self etch system. All right. So the development of composite dentin strength <clears throat> in relation to shrinkage stress as a function of polymerization time. This was first graphed in these papers in 1984, 1987 with Davidson and his team. But again, Davidson is an engineer, not a dentist. And so these engineers have very important information, but they do not understand and they do not test on in vivo teeth or even hydrated teeth with a simulated pulpal fluid that it could be done and, and has been done. But when you read these papers, they're not easy papers to, uh, to de deconstruct, to, to, to understand. Go ahead, Hillary. I know you need to go, need to, go to the bathroom. <laughs> but once I uh, realized that this was one of the main problems of adhesives failures, then I said, okay, let's call this something. Let's call it the hierarchy of bondability. So different parts of the tooth establish the hybrid layer at different strengths and at different times because of the different conditions and locations of the dentin hard tissues. But this is really an important concept. In an adhesive restoration, the composites that you place, they move. They shrink. When they shrink, they move. And they move in the direction depending on what they are bonded to at the time that they are polymerizing. So the first concept from Davidson and his group is called flow of composite. And what flow of composite means, as the movements come, there is polymerization. In other words, you've got polymerase, pol uh, polymerization of monomers that go to oligomers, that go to small polymers, that go to large polymers. And so that polymerization has uh, a, a movement as they get smaller. Every time they link up, they get a little smaller. But once they start cross-linking to each other, these polymers, then they are inhibited in their movements because they can't move sideways as much. They can only move in one direction without stress. And so the flow of composite is important to visualize. So let's look at these. These are molecules. We're gonna call this a monomer. We're gonna call this an oligomer. We're gonna call this a small polymer. And this is a larger polymer. And all of these, once the light is activating the camphor quinone and the, and the free, radical, free radicals are generated, start the polymerization chain reaction that you all's, all learn in organic chemistry that you love so much. I learned to love it. I got an A in it because I was afraid if I didn't get an A in it, I wouldn't get into dental school and then my wife would know that I'm not as perfect as I told her I was before we got married. 
<laughs> but it wasn't a lie. I just had a high opinion of myself before we got married. Okay, we've got the molecules. Let's put the light on them. What happens? Well, they start moving. So during free radical polymerization reactions, monomers link up to become oligomers and polymers. Now, this is the bonded surface. So we call this the hybrid layer, okay? It's been conditioned, it's been primed, it's been polymerized. That hybrid layer, once it's polymerized, has these little oligomers that are sticking out and they're ready for the next free radical to hook up with. But these are in place. They're not moving as long as they don't get pulled by some force above them. So if this layer on top of the dental bonding sister is thin enough, then the movement goes in a very non-stressful way in one direction. So that's called high flow. The polymers can slip past each other and they move in a single direction. Even if there is cross-linking between the polymers, all of them are moving in the same direction. And that's where Davy said if you have a plate-like preparation, that's when you're going to get high, high flow, high bond strength. Those are easy uh, situations to deal with. But now let's look at a preparation that has two walls. So this wall over here, this is the hybrid layer. Again, we've got oligomers coming out of all the hybrid layers. But now <coughs> there's a competition between the directions of flow between one wall and another. And what you have is you have a compromise flow and the molecules still move in one direction, but there is some competition and some stress which usually moves the molecules off the edges of these walls. So this is called a medium C factor situation where you have something that looks more like a bowl and less like a plate. So Davidson summarized it this way. He said, from our exper experiments, it can be con concluded that in setting composites, the stress of polymerization causes this movement we call flow, and that compensates for the shrinkage. In the earliest stage of setting, the shrinkage is maximal, but fortunately the material is weak and able to yield. Presumably, only chain formations can take place and cross-linking is not at full reaction. The molecules can slip into new positions and orientations. This paper is fundamental, but there's a fundamental thing when you read this that your mentor needs to tell you, and that is they are only testing chemical cure composites. And the chemical cure composites are slow to polymerize, because their photoinitiator is not there. There's no photoinitiation in true chemical cure composites. There's only a peroxide and an amine initiator that throws out about a fifth of the amount of free radicals. And so the polymerization would take five minutes instead of uh, what it would take a minute in a photoactivated composite. So the difference between a chemical cure and a photo cured composite is very important and it came right about 1987, 1988 were the times when pretty much everybody started to go to light cure. Takao Fusiyama, the father of adhesive dentistry internationally knew that was a mistake because the polymerization stresses would be increased by going to the camphor quinone initiation instead of the chemical cure. But unfortunately, he didn't understand that the hierarchy of bondability would still be destructive of a chemical cure less stress, and that testing didn't happen in his lifetime, but we can use chemical cure in one application that we can talk about that's very effective, but we don't need that. It's not even desirable in most applications. So light cure is the best way, but you have to realize that you need to overcome the hierarchy of bondability with this decoupling of time principle. <clears throat> and this idea of the bulk factor or volume factor, V factor, uh, 
you need to understand once a composite gets to a certain thickness, then the composite itself becomes like a wall uh, in attracting or pulling the polymerization towards the center of mass and away from the hybrid layer. So here's an example. If we have a bulk of composite, we put the light on it, <coughs> there's a center of mass right here that is going to take the oligomers and move it. This gets larger and all of a sudden it attracts these and you get a peeling area at the sides. Okay. But if you have a concept that a flat preparation versus a more uh, bowl-like preparation versus a cuppy preparation is something that you can uh, understand about how the, the uh, polymerization moves, then you won't make the mistake that many faculties around the world make when they teach their dental students that composite shrinks towards the light. This paper in 1998, that's very old, that's a long time ago, proved that that's just not true. The composite shrinks towards the best bonded surface that it's connected to at that moment in time. If it's connected to enamel, it's going to move towards enamel. If it's connected to superficial dentin, it'll do it to superficial dentin. That's the hierarchy. But if it's only connected to deep dentin, then it can only move towards deep dentin. That's the secret. So enamel, superficial dentin, intermediate dentin, deep dentin, inner caries, outer caries, we would call those the six levels of the hierarchy of bondability. And the composites move towards these numbers and away from these numbers if they're connected with a certain volume or a certain bulk of composite too soon. So again, our topographical map shows that in great detail. And this is what it looks like. If bonded dentin is connected too soon, in other words, enamel and deep dentin are connected, then 30% of the mass of the polymers as they're polymerizing will move towards this center. That will strain this area. And this is like the optical coherence tomography that you've seen several times. You will have a gap form here. Now the gap might be enough to seal the tooth for a certain amount of time. And this is confusing to dentists. And manufacturers of composites and adhesives use this to their advantage. If you do a restoration and it's not sensitive and you had a bulk fill and you say, hey, it worked. <laughs> well, you have to understand that different parts of the tooth bond at different levels at different times. If you have a restoration that that, that's that thick, it's different than a restoration that's that thick, it's different than a restoration that's that thick. And so this documentation of when you have sensitivity is critical. But most dentists don't even want to think about it. All they tell their patient is, well, wait two weeks or two months or two years. Eventually, the sensitivity will go away. But if a tooth dies and the pulp dies, then we'll just do root canals because we're all good at doing root canals. And uh, then you have the problem of what does a root canal mean to a tooth? Well, it means that you've dehydrated the tooth and now the roots are prone to fracture because they are three times as brittle and they are not tough and flexible like a natural tooth is. Mm. So C factor, we want to memorize this, the ratio of bonded to unbonded surfaces. The experiment that this was established on did not have a hierarchy of bondability. When you read this article, your mentor will tell you with no hierarchy of bondability, the stress that they are measuring is the stress in the composite itself. And if you have a large amount of composite, there is less stress. But this experiment was also done with chemical cure composite, which allowed more flow during that five minutes. But in a natural tooth with a hierarchy of bondability, there is always going to be a price to be paid if you try to use chemical cure composites. Because that five minutes now gets you to 
I'm sorry. <clears throat> the five minute mark is the same as a one minute mark with chemical with uh, light cure composites. So there's five times as much <clears throat> interaction with this hierarchy of bondability with a chemical cure than there is with a light cure. <clears throat> so the preps, what do they look like? You've been through that slide. Uh, this concept or this paper uh, had both the testing of C-factor and after it tested the C-factor, it put the uh, restorations under function and it found out that if you don't control for C-factor, you use 50% of your bond strength. In other words, you're not going to 40 or 50, you're going to start with 20. But they found out these lower bond strengths, they could seal the tooth, but when they put them in the chewing machine, then they started to see a fatiguing and a loss of another 10% of bond strength. And the deduction is that over time, you will lose all of your bond strength and you can have a failed restoration. <clears throat> so let's talk about early strategies that uh, were used to try to overcome these hierarchies of bondability. And the early strategies of chemical cure, this was Fusiyama's strategy it had validity, but it did not have the ability to handle all situations. Fusiyama published his book in 1980. Immediately, Martin Brandstrom tested everything that the uh, QRA, what was called Clearfield F system, Clearfield F1, Clearfield F2, Clearfield F3, were the early bonding systems that were chemically cured. And so Martin Brandstrom bought a bunch of it, went to Sweden, did a bunch of preparations and uh, did some in vivo testing on non-primates, non-humans. And they found out that these cavities became reinfected. And so Martin Brandstrom, you know, 1982 in correspond, in uh, corresponding, are, are not corresponding, what's the word? You know, he's trying to show. Fusiyama says, do this, everything's great. Martin Brandstrom does it, and there's infection underneath the restoration. So he wrote an article, Can Infection Under Restoration Be Prevented? And with his technique, it couldn't. And with Fusiyama's technique, it couldn't. But the reason why is that they had a hierarchy of bondability, and the infection was always next to the pulp, just where you don't want it. If you have a restoration that fails the enamel, it's five, four millimeters, three millimeters away from the pulp. The bacteria is not going to get there. But if you have a restoration of your hybrid layer, then you're ready for infection immediately. So Fusiyama and Brandstrom, who both were brilliant and both did great things. We understand the source of hydrodynamic pain, movement of pulpal fluid from Martin Brandstrom. We understand bipolar molecules from Fusiyama, but his first bipolar molecule, phenyl P, it was just not as good as 10 MDP, not even close. But the whole idea of sw switching from a chemical cure dental bonding system to a light cure dental bonding system, that was a huge leap forward. Fusiyama was not the pioneer of that. Oh, there's a lot of history. I won't bore you with all of it. But chemical cure had some validity. And if there's no hierarchy of bondability, such as the pulp chamber in an endodontically treated tooth, this research by Kuro and uh, Angelo Caputo and others showed us that there is less stress with chemical cure and there's less stress if you onlay one cusp and there's less stress if you use an indirect restoration. All of these experiments, when you read these papers, that's how you really begin to understand and see the challenges that the earlier researchers were trying to get to the bottom of. The next strategy was called in uh, semi-direct restoration. It came out of Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska, and this was in the 80s. And they said, well, if we have this polymerization stress, let's just take that uh, composite onlay and take it out of the mouth, make it out of the mouth. And so that's going to be able to reduce the polymerization stress. The problem is it didn't work. They took these onlays are these inlays that were made outside of the mouth, and then they tried to cement them at the same time that they bonded them. In a restoration, trying to be bonded at the same time as cemented, there is a hierarchy of bondability. 
How bondable is the intaglio surface of composite compared to moist dentin at the time that you are bonding that onlay onto the moist dentin? It's no competition. The composite wants to move towards the dry composite intaglio surface away from the dentin. And so the gaps, they continued with this uh, technique, which was called semi-direct restorative techniques. And then finally, an idea came that actually worked. There was no sensitivity in these restorations in England that were pioneered by Naren Wilson and Gary Unterbrink and their team from Ivoclar if they made a layer between the one millimeter of composites. So they would put one millimeter of composite uh, close to the pulp as kind of a liner. And then the bulk on top of this was in two increments, but this black line right here was an unbondable material, kind of like Vaseline. In other words, it totally separated the one millimeter on the bottom from the three or four or five millimeters on the top. When they did that, the sensitivity on the restoration disappeared. And they called this a decoupling technique. And that was because the composite was moving towards the tooth in the most critical area. This massive shrinkage was not affecting this lower layer. But the downside is, what if you're missing a wall? Then all of a sudden, you don't have a connection top to bottom, and so the top of the restoration moves in a different direction than the bottom, so it was limited to class one, class one restorations. <clears throat> Brandstrom, when he uh, gave us the hydrodynamic theory of pain that now we call the hydrodynamic source of pain, said that physical decoupling prevents these gaps at the hybrid layer, but it fails to connect the tooth side to side, top to bottom. So these early strategies failed to solve all the problems of the hierarchy of bondability, but they were important uh, beginning steps. But in a biomimetic restoration, as Davey taught you, there is a direct component in every single biomimetic restoration, whether it's direct, semi-direct or a stress reduced direct. We can do a complete direct restoration. It just takes more time than if you take an impression after your bio base is made. Taking an impression after your bio base is made and then having the restoration made outside the mouth is the most efficient way, but you do not have to do that. There are techniques that were developed by Simone Della Perry and myself called the wallpapering technique that we've been doing for over 15 years, or pu we published the paper in 2017, but we've been doing them for 15 years. But every restoration of a biomimetic approach has a direct base. You're always bonding your enamel replacement to your dentin replacement, and the dentin replacement will always be an adhesive restoration. So these were what we call the modern solutions. Immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, deep margin elevation with the bio base, fiber placement, and stress reduced direct composite. Those are the five techniques, protocols, that have changed the world of dentistry for those who are willing to learn the biomimetic approach. <clears throat> Each of these techniques take time to do. So the time that it takes to do these five protocols is the key. So decoupling with time, it is the solution to the hierarchy of bondability because once you do your immediate debt and ceiling, it will give you 400% uh, bond strength compared to trying to cement your onlay or your inlay at the same time that you, that you bond it. <clears throat> So the bonds take time to develop. Immediate dentin sealing allows the dentin bond to develop in a stress-free environment before subsequent polymerization stresses. It's an easy technique. It's not hard with the self-etching system after air abrasion, which is the six lessons approach. If you don't do air abrasion, you're gonna lose about 30% of your bond strength. You go from 50 to 35. Don't wanna do that. You don't need to do that. So get air abrasion. 
But you prime the detonating enamel for 20 seconds, and then you air dry that primer solvent, which is water, for 10 seconds to get the solvent out. And then you apply the adhesive in a uniform layer. You wick away the excess with clean, dry micro brush. Then you cure for 20 seconds. So this overcomes the hierarchy of bondability by decoupling with time. In an indirect restoration, you would have 30 minutes to two weeks if you had a CEREC machine and you had it milled in 30 minutes or two weeks with a lab. Um, this preparation is not a bio base. Obviously, we would not try to do an indirect restoration here. But with Disha's uh, great cases that she showed today, showed that in these situations, you, as you develop your bio base, you take your impression, the immediate dent sealing is always the foundation of your bio base. The bio base is dentin replacement. So what would be your dentin replacement? At least the DEJ replacement, which would be immediate dentin sealing and resin coating. And then your deep dentin replacement would be your subgingival deep margin elevation. And then any defects that have been made from your uh, dissection of cracks or your deep caries removal, you would restore the dentin missing portion of the tooth with a dentin-like composite like APX from QRA or Voco's Grandioso. But these ideas of the biobase replacing the dentin, it's fundamental. A biomimetic dentist thinks about mimicking the DEJ first and then mimicking the deep dentin second and then mimicking the dentin that's not there third and then mimicking the enamel fourth. But it's a bottom to top approach. So the polymerization stresses break down like this. In that first critical minute, there's 70% of the stress that's in play. If you wait one minute and don't do anything for one minute, then you're eliminating 70% of your stresses. But in that first minute after you polymerize your dental bonding system, if you put composite on that, that's two millimeters, you are going to risk 80% of your bond strength. If you wait three minutes, then you've got 80% of your bond strength that is not at risk because there's no stress, but you've got to keep the stresses low for at least five minutes to get to that 90% mark. If you wait 30 minutes, you get 95%, but in the biomimetic world, what you need is about 70% elimination, or I should say 70 to, yeah, 90% of elimination is what you're, what you're shooting for, and that's the Allamandela Perry rule. So this is what the graphs look like in the published literature. These are polymerization curves. These polymerization curves are the same for dental bonding systems and for composites. This is the critical time right here. At five minutes, they all get to what's called the plateau. So the fast polymerization and then the slow polymerization, you just need to overcome the stress or not engage the stress of the cavity for this five minutes. And that's the beginning of the Allamandela Perry rule. So the key to predictable dentin bonding is that initial layer. It's got to be thick enough to polymerize. <clears throat> if you have an adhesive that is too thin, say 10 microns, which many of the bonding systems brag about, it works fine on enamel. But if you have a 10 micron layer of adhesive, it's totally air inhibited until you put the next layer of composite on that. What is air inhibition? Air quenches the camphorquinones. If you have no camphorquinones, when you put the light on that layer of molecules, they don't polymerize. There's no initiation from a monomer that does not have a free radical coming into it. So the camphorquinone is critical, but it's quenched at a thickness of usually 10 microns, but sometimes 20 microns. If you air thin your adhesive layer, you can increase that to 30 microns. So that's why Disha said and Davy said, wick away your, excessive, your excess adhesive rather than air thin it. Air thin it gives you problems of increasing too much of the air inhibited layer. 
So this is an early paper. Again, you know, it's not an easy paper perhaps to read, but when I read it in 2001, this is when I thought Semabelli was a man. But in a quotient, Semabelli showed that if you do resin coating on top of your immediate dent and sealing with that flowable composite, then all of a sudden it changes the movement of the composite. Instead of moving towards enamel, it moved away from the enamel into the dentin and fractured the enamel. So all of a sudden, out of Japan, we see you can have a stronger bond to dentin as manifest by the shrinkage is breaking enamel rods and it's not breaking the hybrid layer. This is important science. This is, I mean, everybody in this room, they're still here, right? Is like, hey, you don't have to give this lecture tomorrow. All you have to remember is don't get thicker than five, don't get thicker than 1.5 millimeters in the first five minutes after you polymerize your adhesive layer. That's the secret. All right. So the key to predictable dentin bonding is the initial layer thick enough to polymerize, but thin enough to prevent stress. And that thinness number is that 0.5 microns that Disha showed you with her perio probe. Davey uh, taught you about the resin coating uh, protocol. And then this paper that came up from Pramali Jayasuriya, who I found out was also a woman. Who knew? Pramali? Anybody from Sri Lanka here? You probably knew that Primali is a female name. Had no idea until I met a dentist from Sri Lanka. But Primali Jayasuriya was at TMDU, and they made this paper on resin coating, and they found out that if you put this half millimeter and then you pulled apart the restoration, you couldn't pull it off the dentin. If you did not resin coat, then you could pull your restoration, whether it was direct or indirect, off of the dentin. So we call that a secure bond strategy because even if a rest restoration fails, it's a clinical failure, it's not a biologic failure. So this was important information that came in 2003 out of TMDU, Tokyo Medical and Dental University. So here it is graphically, if you wait, then the dentin bond will mature in a low C factor and this is critical. Everybody should look Let's back up right here. So tomorrow, your first preparation, you're going to look at it, and you're going to make a calculation. What is the surface area here? Whatever it is, say it's, give it a number, two. That surface area, if you put your adhesive on it, so this is called the unbonded surface. This bottom part is the bonded surface. So in your immediate dent and sealing, what's the ratio of bonded to unbonded surface area? You got two over two, that means one, right? So a C factor ratio of bonded to unbonded surfaces at this point is basically one. And so that's very low, that's like a plate. Now, this kind of looks like a cup or a bowl, but for this moment, that layer of resin feels like it's in a plate because it doesn't know that the other parts even exist. This immediate dent and sealing doesn't know that this immediate dent and sealing is there. But as soon as you bulk fill this, then this and this are connected and the stress becomes that of a cuppy shape uh, preparation where you lose 50% of your bond strength. So now let's go to the next step. <clears throat> you put the polymerization of the light on. If you wait five minutes from this point to get to a thickness of composite that connects these two sides of the wall, then this immediate dent and sealing matures in what it thinks is a flat surface. So this high C factor potential is limited because the layers in the initial polymerization curve are low. So we do our resin coating. Now again, if we do a layer of this resin coating at 0.5 and we compare that to the bonded surface here, 
what's the ratio? About the same. It's still a ratio of about one. So right now, we've got a half millimeter of composite on the tooth. Just a half millimeter. All of that composite is moving towards the tooth, plus it takes time to do this. How long does it take to do a careful resin coating and a light cure polymerization? It takes a minute and 30 seconds. And so we're trying to wait for five minutes <coughs> to have that polymerization curve get up to the plateau. How do we do that? Well, we just make sure that we're very careful on how thick we get after that. So these uh, principles are applied in this bio base that we're creating, which is the dentin replacement. If you're missing three millimeters of dentin, you replace three millimeters of dentin. If you uh, have a deep box where you're replacing root dentin, you're replacing the root dentin. But the principles of immediate dentin sealing and resin coating don't change. <clears throat> when we raise these boxes, we will use the same principles of immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, and this deep margin elevation concept that Davey introduced you to where we're actually taking the deep dentin, which we would call subgingival dentin, and replacing that separately from the coronal dentin, that also takes time to do. So a deep margin elevation is a critical portion of the bio-based construction that also takes time. And so when we are <coughs> reconstructing these deep boxes here with immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, and with incremental buildup, raising that box so it's super gingival, how much time does that take to do? It takes at least five minutes. So if you have a deep box that's subgingival and you do your immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, and your box, you're at five minutes. So we restore these deep boxes directly with low C-factor layers. In other words, these increments that are placed to uh, reconstruct this, this box are done very carefully with a minimum volume to make sure that that volume does not connect too many portions of the hierarchy of bondability in this deep root uh, area, particularly if you have decay on the axial wall. And so the way we do that and integrating that with fiber becomes a way to uh, mimic this progressive flexibility and preserve maximum tooth structure and re relocate the margin super gingerly, as Davey taught earlier. And so different areas of the tooth exhibit different moduli of elasticity. A mismatch will create bond fatigue under function and so when we diagnose this portion of the hierarchy of bondability as root dentin, we need to see that we are treating that with a separate procedure. If you bulk fill that area, all of a sudden, the lowest part of the hierarchy of bondability is always the bottom part of your box. So that gingival floor of an interproximal box is the most at risk of failure and you, anybody who's been a dentist for more than a couple of years see that your vast majority of leakage and re-decay will start at that area. So this layering technique that we recommend, it's been investigated and does layering increase, I'm sorry, does layering decrease shrinkage and composite movement? And the answer is no. That shrinkage happens, you cannot not have a shrinking composite. But what you can do is to make sure that that shrinkage does not negatively affect the hybrid layer. That's the critical concept. So we are always going to have shrinkage, but the stress can be not directed towards the hybrid layer. 
Now, here's an article that was published by a top team out of Europe, and they were trying to disprove uh, the ideas that layering um, is the best way to approach a composite restoration. It's a finite elemental analysis. That type of uh, research is generated through a, compo a computer. You put information in the computer. The computer makes certain assumptions and certain results come out. And they came out with the right conclusion that you, it doesn't minimize uh, shrinkage. But when they said, does layering minimize shrinkage stress in composites, they didn't differentiate between the three kinds of stresses. Remember we talked about stress goes three areas. It can go to the hybrid layer, it can go to the strain in the tooth, or it can go on the composite. Now the stresses in all three of those areas are stresses from polymerization. So the conclusion where they say it doesn't matter when you have a layering technique, it doesn't decrease the stress, that's right. But the layering technique changes where the stress is manifest. That is important. It's critical. And when this was published and I read it, I just about screamed that so they could hear it in Holland. That you guys are wrong. You don't understand what you just said. Now, Dutch people are pretty stubborn. They don't like to be told they're wrong. Well, me, I don't like to be told I'm wrong either. Davy, even less. Hillary, she's never wrong, so she doesn't have to deal with that. Hey, that's good. Everybody's so, uh, I can't tell if you're awake or asleep, so I just have to tell the lame joke to see if that happens. But research can come to the wrong conclusion is what I'm trying to say. Just because it's published in the Journal of Dental Research doesn't mean they got it right. That's where science has to be discussed. My dad was a physicist. You know, quantum mechanics was taught to him in graduate school in the 30s before World War II. You know, all the stuff that led to nuclear weapons, it was all theoretically until, you know, it, it worked. But here's an example of a paper. And this is a paper that every one of you can access. I don't know if it's that easy to access online, but uh, you contact me, you DM me, I can make it happen for you. But it was published in 2004 by a team uh, from Germany, led by a key researcher, or a researcher from Russia. Uh, named Nikolenko, and what they did is they had this preparation, which is four by four by four, and as Davey showed you in his lecture, they tried every layering technique possible. And so these horizontal techniques, vertical techniques, and oblique techniques were shown with bulk fill, two millimeter increments, two millimeter increments vertical or oblique, and then these one millimeter increments one millimeter increments vertical and oblique, and they came out, bulk fill, got 11 megapascal bond strength in the pulpal floor. You can get up to 15, 16, even 19 with the vertical or the oblique, but the only way you can get and double this bond strength or triple the bond strength from the bulk is to do four horizontal increments. And why? It's because this layer only engages one of the hierarchy of bondabilities. They're the same. So if there's no difference in the hierarchy of bondability, that means the stress is distributed either in the tooth or the composite. And if it's thin, the composite stretches a little bit, the tooth doesn't move, and that's the best place to have stress manifest is in the layer of composite. And so this didn't challenge the hierarchy of bondability. These all challenge the hierarchy of bondability because they're connecting enamel to deep dentin too soon. All of those layers do, and that's the manifestation that you lose 80% of your bond strength or 50% of your bond strength or 40% of your bond strength. But this idea of 30 being a key number in an in vitro test, again, validated the idea that if you can get a bond strength to dentin that is as strong as the cohesive strength of enamel. In other words, if you pull enamel apart, it takes 30 megapascals to pull it apart. In this restoration, this area here, to pull that one millimeter layer of composite off the tooth takes exactly the same amount of stress as it would take to 
pull a mammal from a part, uh, enamel from itself. So that's called biomimicking or biomimicry, where something like enamel, that bond strength is the same as the bond to dentin. And 30 can be increased if we make these layers even thinner. And that's what a stress-reduced direct technique uh, engages. And so these thin layers, as Davy said, we're stacking plates on top of plates on top of plates. And that means that this area here has more time to develop its bond strength before there's another layer here. And this layer here does not affect this layer. But this two millimeters, if it's immediately put on top of the immediate dentin ceiling, then you lose your bond strength 50%. So thin horizontal increments, they separate the hierarchies of bondability, low bondability from high bondability for a certain number of minutes. And so this little uh, illustration adds this second uh, concept of placing fiber. And if we place fiber in these thin horizontal increments, this is the technique that Simone Della Perry and I have developed that we call the wallpapering technique. But Simone, when he published his paper with Dave Bardwell in 2002, showed a technique of creating a wall in a proximal shell first and then doing a dentin replacement with, in this situation, seven, inc seven increments of, of composite. Instead of four increments, seven increments, does even more because we're only putting that increment composite towards one wall, basically. And that's a, a classic paper that needs to be read by every biomimetic dentist, 2002 Journal of American Dental Association. And so here's an old case that I did, but we added fiber underneath the stress-reduced uh, um, small volume increments. But if we use a 1.5, these are 2.0 balls of composite, they're only touching dentin, then when they polymerize, they only move towards dentin. And they're only engaging one part of the hierarchy of bondability, that of deep or intermediate dentin. In this situation, we had about two millimeters of dentin replacement and two millimeters of enamel replacement. But these one to 1.5 wedge shape <laughs> increments combining pulse and progressive cures to minimize C factor. This is called the stress-reduced direct composite technique. We named that in 2009. Um, 2002, it didn't have a name, but uh, the paper that we published in PPAD still is a very important paper to understand this technique. And so everybody should be able to see a peripheral seal zone, crack-free, decay-free to a certain depth, cracks that are deeper than five are left. <clears throat> In the central stop zone, areas of decay or crack would be left. But we have four millimeters of restorative material that we need to place. We mimic the DEJ with immediate dentin sealing, resin coating, and fiber placement. And then we start our dentin replacement with these small increments. And then we start to connect the small increments. There's a little more stress, but the stress is on the increment. The high bond is always in one surface going in one direction, one surface, one surface, one surface. And again, with the fiber on the bottom, then that protects the, uh, the hybrid layer from any stresses. But at this point, we have two millimeters of dentin replacement. We call that the biobase. This is going to be a completely direct restoration, but it has the biobase. And the biobase definition is a stress reduced dentin replacement. You could take an impression and make an inlay. You could take an impression, make a semi direct chair side inlay or a lab based inlay. But in this situation, we continued and we created the restoration to the finished step. And so as we put the incremental cusp development here, uh, there's actually the bio base is showing through in the grooves here. These uh, individual cusp replacements are not connected to each other. 
And 10 years later, the restoration looks like that. Now, people, when I show this case, they say, well, what about these cracks into enamel? Cracks to enamel are biomimetic. The natural tooth enamel cracks under stress, particularly under years. The more, the older you are, when you're 70 years old, all my enamel has cracks on it. But the vast majority of the cracks stop at the DEJ. It only is when the crack in enamel passes the DEJ and becomes sensitive from the hydrodynamic movement of fluid that it's not biomimetic. So cracks into dentin are stable, but if you have a crack into, I'm sorry, cracks in enamel can be stable if the dentin connection is in place. But these cracks, remember, once you connect the tooth side to side, front to back and top to bottom, like Davey taught you, the expansion of the tooth goes to about seven microns. If it's not connected side to side, then the expansion that caused these enamel cracks <clears throat> is about 175 microns. So these cracks on this patient, when she came in for treatment, she had a gold inlay. She had the cracks. She was symptomatic. She went to her dentist in California, and he said, well, we just need to have a root canal and a crown. And her daughter, who was being treated by us, said maybe you ought to come here and get it treated and she was 70 years old and she decided to come to Utah we treated her biomimetically these cracks that were giving her symptoms once the tooth was reconnected side to side front to back and top to bottom her symptoms were gone she lived for another 12 years and she never needed a root canal or crown those are the kinds of satisfactions and the kinds of things that your patients want and that you can provide if you have training and can deliver a biomimetic result where the tooth stays connected side to side, front to back. And so this last modern solution that we're going to give you is a lot of people freak out because they see something new and they go, why would you do that? And your answer always is the science supports this. Placing fiber in a restoration to preserve the bond strength of the hybrid layer is a scientifically established principle in three different con continents out of five different labs from highly respected researchers, and their research is published in journals that are published. If you read English, you can read these. This paper that was published in 2007 by Sema Belli showed that placing fiber means that you can have a leak-free restoration even in a bulk fill. These composite DOs and MOs were bulk filled. That's stress. But still, if you stress scientifically in a situation and then you remove stress, then your ability to keep your bond and stop the leakage is even better. But this fiber that's right here and right here and right here is stopping the leakage here, here, here. When you read this paper, you see that the stress relief from the fiber insert decreases the gap formation, and that decreasing the potential of microleakage, and microleakage is the beginning of all the biologic failures. So this is how Ribbon works. We have a hybrid layer. This is dentin. Your immediate dentin ceiling of 40 microns once it's polymerized, is moving only towards the dentin, okay? The next layer, this darker blue layer, is your 500 microns of resin coating. You put the light on that, again, it's only moving in one direction because the amount of composite is so small. Now, we get to one, micro, or one millimeter of composite. This one millimeter of composite, that's a thousand microns. When we put the fiber in it, it does something very, very great. It allows the composite in these small little areas between the fibers to move in one of two directions. Half of them go up, half of them go down. The composite shrinkage of the mass on top of these bonds very strongly these mass 
of the composite in this ribbon layer move towards our resin coating. If you pull this apart, it only takes about 20 megapascals to pu pull this apart. If you pull just composite, if you just had composite, it takes about 40 megapascals. And so we have an area here that if there was a failure under long-term function, this would be your weak link. It's like in a car that has a bumper that's not metal and it's plastic. It crumples, but it doesn't do structural damage. And so this was demonstrated uh, by an endodontically... Uh, endodontic team out of Turkey named Erkut, and Erkut showed uh, in these ribbon posts on endodontically treated tooth, teeth, which are huge C factors. You see an endodontically treated uh, anterior incisor. What's the ratio of the bonded to unbonded surface in that condition? It's very, very high. And so the stresses of composite are going to go one of three places, right? The hybrid layer, the massive composite, or the tooth uh, is going to be strained inward. Well, Erkut found that when they put this fiber on both sides of the endodontically treated tooth, ribbond, not only did it act like a post, but it decreased the stress and guaranteed the bond and the seal on the endodontically treated tooth. All of the other post systems failed. They all had leakage, but the ribbon post did not. And the reason why is because we had this separation of the fiber and the hybrid layer was never disrupted. It always had a seal and the middle of the composite in this endodontically treated tooth, that massive composite, it polymerized strongly. It acted like a composite post but it had no negative effect on the hybrid layer, so it kept the seal. So in 2008, when that was published, I called up Dave Rudo and said, Rudo, your next two grandchildren should be called Belly and Urkut. But he didn't have any, he only has three grandchildren, so he didn't get any more. Maybe your children could be Belly and Urkut. <laughs> All right, it's not a hard technique. You just have to have uncured composite, a ball of two millimeters pressed becomes one millimeter. In the uncured composite, you press the fibers, and then once you get it in the right place, you wet that. I believe we got a video, right, Davey? Sometimes you put a little tab of flowable to uh, help adaptation of our dentin replacing composite. You see that both of these shells have been created interproximally. When you create the shells, that takes time. That helps in the maturation of the bonds. Now, once you get the uncured composite at approximately one millimeter, that's the time to place your fiber, and the fiber can be placed in multiple um, pieces or in one piece in this situation will be on the pulpal and the axial walls. Takes a little time to do this, but that's all good because the time it takes you to place the rib on allows the maturation of your hybrid layer. So after Davey gets his position, then he'll wet that with unfilled resin. And the rib bond will disappear. I mean, it, you won't be able to see it very well. Then you can take a dry brush and wick away a little of the excess adhesive. And 
And again, once you incorporate the fiber protocol into your bio base, you can't do that faster than five minutes. So it guarantees that the decoupling with time principle is in place. All right. So the biomimetic protocols that promote decoupling with time, peripheral seal zone and carries removal endpoints gives you the high bond strength. Immediate dentin sealing maximizes your bond strength. Resin coating gives you the fail safe and takes time to place. <clears throat> Careful increments, thin increments take more time than bulk fill. Using an indirect restoration, a semi-direct restoration, uh, stress relieves the enamel replacement, but it has to be used with immediate dentin sealing and resin coating. Vertical defects uh, take a deep margin elevation as a separate procedure, and that also takes time. And fiber placement, again, takes time. All of those utilize, all of those strategies uh, utilize time to overcome the hierarchy of bondability so that you maximize the bond strength, you maximize the seal of each of these areas. None of these areas are compromised in their potential bond strength by using those seven strategies. So decoupling with time, it neutralizes the hierarchy of bondability so that you can maximize all of your bond strengths on your heterogeneous bonding surfaces. Decoupling with time, overcoming the hierarchy of bondability. Is that the last slide, Davey? I make it? We got one more? Oh, here we go. Follow us on Instagram. My old account got hacked. We had about 30,000, 32,000 followers. Got stolen by thieves. Now we're back to about 5,000. But uh, if you want more information about the mastership program we teach, uh, we'd love to uh, have you in our next, next group, which starts in two weeks. That's it. Thank you. An awesome uh, session of uh, lectures and uh, uh, Devi, we weren't bored at all. So we, I think most of us are awake, right? So can I have a big round of applause, please? So thank you so much, both of you, for that wonderful lectures and sessions and to Disha for her uh, sharing your uh, cases with us. Um, we have a couple of questions from uh, the online participants as well. Um, this is regarding uh, the pulp exposure in cases of uh, deep uh, caries when you manage them. Yeah. Um, they are asking whether uh, uh, resin modified glass enema cement would be uh, good enough or you need to have a calcium silicate based cement. Yeah, glass ionomer is not appropriate in any biomimetic reconstruction. It's too brittle and it has too weak of a bond. So the modulus elasticity of dentin is someplace between 12 and 18. The modulus elasticity of glass ionomer is around 3. The bond strength's potential uh, that we're looking for are 30 to 50. Uh, the bond strength in glass ionomer is about 11. So there's no advantage to using glass ionomer. We do use glass ionomer for sealants. There's a good reason to use that for sealants. Not resin modified glass ionomer, but just straight glass ionomer. It has been proven long term for sealants, but that's not a biomimetic uh, application. That's a minimally invasive uh, application. And uh, one more question is, what is your preferred temporary material of choice for interappointment that is? Temporary. So we just use Clip or Telio. There was another product that uh, I think Disha use, uses. Disha, and that, think Disha uh, can answer that because we need something which is available in India. Yeah. I use something called as uh, Tempit by Spident Company. Uh, it's available with uh, Circamed. Okay, you can buy it. It's a blue color. It comes in blue and yellow. So the blue color is better to buy because you have to remove it next time. So even if it's uh, stuck to your bio base, uh, you can just see and remove it next time and give it a good air abrasion. <coughs> it just comes out. Yeah. 
it's temp it by spident okay and i have a couple of questions yeah. uh, the the one uh, was that how how much of san, uh, air abrasion do we do and actually disha showed one where she had overdone it and uh, caused a pulp exposure so right so uh, disha's exposure was because a deep carious lesion on top of a pulp horn you need to compress that with air abrasion without water if you do it dry then that layer of outer caries will actually compress uh, and become the covering over the exposure but if you use water that layer will become hydrated and it will lift off so it's actually the water not the air abrasion that caused the problem there so you just need to have a dry compression of those deep areas of decay uh, to have success on that okay but once it's treated the way that Adisha did it it's not a problem it just takes more time okay another question regarding air abrasion the air abrasion unit that Adisha uses is uh, very expensive for most of us right so, so uh, would a, a normal air abrasive unit a sandblasting unit a chair side sandblasting unit be okay yeah a chair side micro um micro Abrasion. etcher uh danville makes a micro etcher uh, bisco makes a micro etchers probably seven cent many com companies do but yeah those are messy but they work so you just have to have your assistant squirt water uh, and suction at the same time to help control the dust uh so we don't have danville in India. Mm -hmm. What you can use is from BioArt company. There's a micro etcher. You can buy that. The only thing is you'll not get the wet. It's, it's a dry system and you can use that. Mm -hmm. You can use 29 to 50 micron particles. If you're using 50, less time would be needed. 29, you would need a little more time. That's the only difference. Yeah, the surface will kind of look matte. After you air bray, you want to rinse off the particles and then you dry that and will just look uh, a matte. It won't, won't be shiny. Okay, now uh, most of your cases that you showed that KD is detecting dye once you wash them off, the color still stays back. Does it affect the bonding in any way? Uh, no. Okay. And one more question. I'm being fast because I know everybody's hungry. Um, it could be, um, uh, now there are a lot of short fiber, I mean, you are also using Everex posterior and all that. Would that do instead of ribbon? No. Uh, Everex no. posterior is very different. It is a good dentin replacement, but it needs to be off of the uh, dentin bonding system. Your hybrid layer, if you put just your Everex on top of that without resin coating, it will weaken your bond because it shrinks too much. So the actual res resin in the Everex posterior has a high, high shrinkage and a high stress, but it's great for fracture resistance. So what we recommend is using Ribond as your DEJ replacement, and then on top of the Ribond, you can use Everex, particularly in endodontically treated teeth. That's called a Ribond basket, and then we fill the basket with Everex. Okay. But they're diff they, they, they have two different uh, potentials. Okay, and you are using heated composite instead of uh, resin cement, so yes. how do you ensure that uh, it's cured fully? During uh, your indirect bonding. Yes, I mean it, it will it will it will cure th if you're using Emacs onlay. It can be cured even seven millimeters in a composite onlay. Three millimeters will, it will the light will get through three millimeters. So what about uh, zirconia? We don't use zirconia. Zirconia is poor bondability yeah, uh, and the but, modulus but elasticity. But here in India, a lot of people use zirconia. That's the reason why I'm asking. Yeah, so, so in that a lot case, of maybe we can use the <laughs> So the biomimetic dentist will not use zirconia. You won't okay. get any light uh, passage through zirconia. Yeah. So you have to use either a composite or an Emacs if you're going to use a heated composite. So what mm -hmm. about uh, the second molars or the third molars? Uh, we can use Emacs crowns, I mean Emacs onlys. I prefer composite. I think you'll do better with composite. If you have too thin of an Emacs onlay on a second molar, then it will fracture. Yeah. And the thinness is usually 1.5. You've got to have 1.5 after occlusal adjustment. So you have to be very careful with that. You know, I don't like to reduce a tooth to make room for a, an, an overlay or an onlay. So a composite, you can get very thin with your overlay, uh, and it's much more user-friendly on a second molar 
if you have a patient that you think is high function uh, and could do some damage just with normal of uh, their high function abilities, then a thin gold onlay bonded to a biobase is the solution there because you can have half a millimeter of gold bonded onto a biobase. Oh, that's, that's, that's nice. Any questions from the audience? Sorry. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I have a question to ma'am. Ma'am, in one of your cases where you have left a very thin layer of uh, infected dentine for you to bond it well and not expose the pulp. So in such cases, would you recommend to use something like bioactive composite to layer the thin layer to the composite to remineralize or the tooth to remineralize before you go ahead? So if you read the article from Dr. Van Verbeek 2020, which is like a 20 page article, at the end of the article, it shows that the bioactive competitors have been a biggest failure till now. They did a three year study and they had to stop at one year. They couldn't even finish the three year. There was so much of failure. So don't get carried away. The bioactive composites right now have not reached to that potential where you can use it for your That's clinical nice purposes. That's a nice way to say that, Disha. Bioactive materials are garbage. Don't use them. Anyone? Okay, uh, so then we wind up this uh, wonderful session. Thank you once again, Dr. David and Dr. Thank Devi, you. Disha, and Hillary also for supporting them. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the SRM University, especially Mahalakshmi ma'am, Kavita ma'am, who's been, you know, constantly behind the, they have done all the work behind the scene. I would like to thank all the postgraduate students, the AV. And lastly, I would like to thank everybody present here on behalf of Alamans and us. Uh, thank you because I know you've been traveling from very far. Some of you have been traveling long and far to attend this lecture. And a very, very thank you for coming and listening to us. Thank you. So we uh, quickly call upon Dr. Meena, uh, she, Professor and Head, VS Dental College, Bangalore. She's come all the way from Bangalore to listen to you all. Uh, to give away, to give uh, our appreciation to Dr. David. I now call upon Dr. Kurunji Amalavati. She is the head of the department of uh, uh, Satyabama Dental College. Sorry. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Sujata and Dr. Kavita to give it to the Disha. <laughs> Come. <laughs> Bo both are from SRM Riddle College. <laughs> and thank you. Lunch is being served in the second floor, same hall above. Uh, please do join us. And sorry for the late lunch.
I request all the delegates to join us for lunch in the second floor lecture hall too. Thank you.